Your job has so many functions. <laughs> to provide care. <laughs> to enlighten with knowledge and understanding. To ensure good health. Every day there are signs, some obvious, some hidden, that a child in your care is being physically or sexually abused or neglected. When you learn to recognize the signs of child abuse and neglect and respond appropriately, you will become an integral part of a community determined to strengthen families by preventing abuse and neglect of children in Virginia. It's important that we recognize the family in all of this, that we want the family to continue and mandatory reporting is, is not an effort to always break up families, it's an effort to recognize problems within families or, and to recognize the need to, to move on. So we need teachers to be part of that full circle. They're, they're involved with the child part of the day and then other care providers are, are involved the rest of the day and then they usually go home to their parents. So we have to have a full circle of individuals around that child and everyone in that circle has to be able to recognize abuse and neglect signs. Your help is required by law. A look around the Commonwealth shows the value of your compliance with the law. The Virginia Department of Social Services reports that across the state, nearly 9,000 children were found to be the victims of at least one form of abuse or neglect in just one year. Not only does the abuse cross cultural and economic lines, it also occurs outside of the family in institutions and places that many families trust to look out for the well-being of their children. The most predominant type of child abuse is neglect, followed by physical and sexual abuse. Some children were also the victims of emotional maltreatment and medical neglect. 31 children in Virginia died as a result of abuse or neglect by their parents or caretakers. As a professional who is responsible for providing care to children, you are required by Virginia law to immediately report suspicions of abuse and neglect to your local Department of Social Services or the Child Abuse and Neglect Hotline. This law covers professionals who work in a large variety of programs where children are provided with services and care. It's Nancy, she knows how to help children when things like this happen. Um, good morning, this is um, Kathy Price. I'm the uh, school nurse at Smith Elementary in Fair Lake. When you make a good faith effort at reporting suspected child abuse and neglect, you are immune from liability and your name will be kept confidential. To effectively follow this law, it's important to have a clear understanding of the different types of child abuse and neglect that occur. Neglect can be the result of the family's current status. A major family crisis, job loss, or serious illness can oftentimes mean the depletion of adequate care. Or it can be a continuation of a cycle of neglect that has occurred for generations. Younger children are at greater risk of neglect due to their own inability to meet basic survival needs. Children of parents who are substance abusers are also at increased risk. When a child is neglected, it damages their self-esteem because basically what the, mes the message that is conveyed to that child is you don't matter, you're not important. As a result, these children have difficulty with relationships and difficulty with attachment. Um, they are also at risk of sexual abuse because often these children are so hungry for attention from others that they are not able to say no to inappropriate requests. Defining physical abuse is a matter of drawing the line between corporal punishment and the kind of punishment that causes injury. Physical abuse most often occurs when an adult is angry or frustrated and strikes a child resulting in injury. It is not uncommon for people to confuse discipline with abuse. The state doesn't want to interfere with a parent's rights to discipline their children. We all have that right. But in reference to a child having the right to be free from harm and injuries, that's where we have, it's a thin line, but we have to draw that line in reference to trying to offer children the same protection that we have as adults. Perhaps the most disturbing form of child abuse is sexual abuse. Too many children in Virginia are victims of acts of sexual abuse. These acts violate a child's most basic need for emotional and physical safety. It is as if they are prisoners in their own family, neighborhood, school, or church. Children who have been sexually abused have been robbed of their childhood innocence. 
often by a trusted adult. Their loyalty, trust in the relationship with that adult has been manipulated for the adult's own personal gratification. Other children are victims of emotional maltreatment, while still others are born after having been exposed to drugs or alcohol during pregnancy. Such treatment is identified in Virginia's child abuse and neglect laws. Because abuse and neglect can be passed from generation to generation, it is even more vital that you understand how to recognize the warning signs and begin the important task of preventing abuse and neglect from being passed down to new generations of children. There's a thin line between poverty and neglect. And we have to keep that in mind when we're working with families because poverty looks just like neglect. And that, that requires our caretakers, our teachers, our nurses to have some working knowledge of the family in regard to just where they are economically. And if you're able to make that distinction, then you, you're in a better position to know when a family is just dealing at the best level they can and when there's truly an issue where a child is going without because of neglect. The signs of neglect, consistent hunger, poor hygiene, lack of supervision and unattended health care needs are a call to action on your part. When you speak with a child about your observations or if a child tells you about the possibility of neglect in her family, these general guidelines will help ensure that the conversation is handled sensitively, thereby creating a sense of security for that child. So Brittany, can you tell me why you came to see me today? This is why told me to come see you because I can't see the blackboard. Okay. You're looking at the crackers. Did you want the crackers? Are you hungry? Okay. You can have the crackers. Here we go. Did you have breakfast this morning? No. Well, it's almost lunchtime now. Uh, did you bring lunch? <laughs> Sometimes my friends share their lunch with me. Hmm, they do. Um, when was the last time you ate? Mm. My sister took a spaghetti last night. Really? Okay. Where was your mom? Asleep. I can cook too. Really? What do you cook? I can cook spaghetti and bologna. Wow! All by yourself? You must be very proud of yourself. Um, do you dress yourself? Did you dress yourself this morning? You did? You are very responsible, Brittany. Tell me, did you take a bath this morning? Mmm, I don't know. No? When was the last time you had a bath? Mmm, I don't know. Hmm, okay. Well, who made sure that you got to school today? I did. Really? All by yourself again? Where was your mom? She was asleep. She was? Between your observations and your conversation with the child, you should be able to determine if there is suspicion of neglect. A child's statements will often help to clarify your suspicions. Do you have a regular doctor who you see when you don't feel well? Mm. Okay. Brittany, I am really glad you came to see me today. And you know what we're going to do? We are finally going to do that eye exam, okay? So we're going to do that. And then why don't you and I go get some lunch? These answers are indicative of a child who may be a victim of neglect. Physical abuse can be well hidden by fearful lies and hits to the areas of the body not revealed by clothing. But if you have a child in your care who reports pain or has injuries, there are ways to determine if the injury or pain is a result of accidental injury or physical abuse. There's no doubt that children are very active um, and after the age of one have great gross motor skills um, that can get them into a lot of trouble out on a playground or even in household play. And there are studies out in the literature that show that the average three-year-old has 12 bruises on their body at any one given point of time. So how do we discern the difference between inflicted injury versus accidental injury? There are several elements of, of the injury that help you identify whether it was inflicted or accidental. Inflicted injuries will be evident in scars that look far different than the accidental fall off a bike or scraped knee. Accidental injuries most often occur on the bony parts of the body, knees, elbows, shins, or forehead. Inflicted injuries affect the soft or hidden parts of a body, the back, thighs, buttocks, and the back of the legs. The greater the number of injuries, the greater the cause for concern. Unless a child is involved in a serious accident, that child is unlikely to sustain multiple injuries. 
multiple injuries in different stages of healing may indicate abuse. Abusive injuries are often inflicted with familiar objects, such as a belt, stick, and paddle. The resulting marks often bear a strong resemblance to the instrument that was used. Accidental injuries resulting from bumps and falls usually have no defined shape. If an injury is accidental, there should be a reasonable explanation of how it happened that is consistent with the appearance of the injury. When the injury and the explanation are inconsistent, there is cause for concern. These photographs are of children who have had injuries inflicted by their parents or caretakers. There is frequently an expectation from the caretaker that their developmental is, level is much higher than their age. Um, so they expect them to get this activity done in a fashion similar to an adult. That it, it's not, it shouldn't be a task to be able to eat and it shouldn't be able to task to be able to get dressed. So when the caretaker loses patience with this aged child, um, the child is frequently grabbed around the upper part of the arm, around the forearm, frequently around the face. You'll find oval matching marks over either um, jawline from being forced to eat at a faster rate or forced to brush their teeth at a faster rate. When you look at this picture, there are more than a dozen bruises that have been incurred to this right um, lower extremity area. And these bruises are not all of the same age. Um, they're in different stages of healing, and that can be determined by the fact that they're different in coloration. This location um, is not a bony prominence area on this child. It is mostly soft tissue. Um, it would be unusual for this child um, to have a couple of bruises in this area, uh, much less the greater than one dozen bruises that we see. Loop marks are inflicted by a variety of instruments, Venetian blind cords, ropes, electrical cords, um, belts, so common household items that are used um, to hit the child. This picture shows us an example of classic switch marks. The location of these marks is across this child's buttocks. The child that we're seeing here actually was still diaper dependent, so the diaper needed to have been taken off for these marks to be inflicted. The explanation that was offered for these marks when this child was examined was actually that it was a diaper rash. Um, a daycare worker is actually who identified the lesions and spoke to social services about it because of her concern that it was not consistent with the diaper rash. And ligature marks simply represent an area in which a child was bound or tied um, and left somewhere for a protracted period of time. With that child being bound, it is most frequently um, by a rope. It can be by other forms of restraints like handcuffs. Um, with the child moving against that restraint, um, usually what occurs is breakdown and rubbing of the skin so that the injury that is left is similar to um, a rope burn mark. Behavior can also tell a significant story. A child who is being physically abused may be apprehensive when other children cry, recoil from fast movement by a parent, caretaker, or other adults, be reluctant or afraid to go home. The same conversational guidelines used when talking with a child about suspected neglect can also be used when talking with a child about suspected physical abuse. Well, with most people, you just want to first get to know the child. You just want to ask him some general questions about um, his name, where he lives, who he lives with, uh, does he have any sisters or brothers? Are they older? Are they younger? Who's his favorite teacher? You're just kind of getting them to feel comfortable with you. And then you use a little bit of yourself. You tell them who you are, um, and that I've been asked to come out to talk with you, and you, know, you identify the teacher or the principal, someone that they really know, you know, and that's my friend, and we just needed to talk to you about something. And then you begin to engage them into whatever the issues are. This will help you learn more about feelings the child may be holding inside feelings that may be a sign of any type of abuse or neglect. This? this where you bumped it? Wow, buddy. That looks awful sore. Is that hurting you? What happened? I don't know. You're not sure? Mm -mm. How did that happen? I don't know. Maybe when I fell down. Or when did you fall down? When I was at my house. Buddy, that looks sore. Does it hurt? <laughs> I don't think you did that bumping into the shelf, do you? How did it happen? I don't know. You don't remember? 
I think I broke the rules or something. You broke the rules. Has anybody else ever hit you like this? No. It must really hurt, huh? Have you told anybody else about this? No. Why haven't you told anybody? That looks like it's really sore. Because my dad said if I told anybody, he would hit me any, even harder. I think we should probably talk to Miss Nancy. She knows how to help children when things like this happen. Would that be okay? Okay. The child may be fearful or apprehensive, so it's important not to press for details that they are unable or unwilling to give. Building trust and showing support may be the first step in helping ensure the safety of that child. Neglect and physical abuse show their signs in far more obvious ways than sexual abuse. So often when a child is sexually abused, the emotional scars, like the secretive nature of the act, are hidden. Those scars, however, can last a lifetime. Your responsibility is to recognize the patterns of behavior that are manifest in a child who is being sexually abused. A child who is living a life of sexual abuse is living a life of fear. Sexual abuse can have disastrous effects on that child's development. Sexually abused children can acquire sexually transmitted diseases or become pregnant. Their academic success can be stilted from a lack of concentration. Many sexually abused kids wind up having a difficult time trusting others and suffer from shame and guilt, even believing the abuse was their fault. But you can have a positive effect on that child by recognizing the signs of sexual abuse. It's vital because teachers, especially daycare providers, are with children all day long. They are the key folks who know if something is different as recognized in the child's behavior or academic performance. They are your first identifiers. So they're in a good position to report any of their suspicions to Child Protective Services. Finally, we can't act until someone calls us. In some cases, a sexually abused child may have detailed knowledge of sexual behavior that is inappropriate for his or her age. A child may create sexually explicit drawings. The type of play a child has with either peers or toys may sometimes be sexual in nature. A child may no longer like or want to be with a particular person or go to a specific place. The child's academic performance may deteriorate. The child may have sudden, noticeable behavior changes, such as mood swings or withdrawal from social situations. A child may be excessively concerned about sexual identity or homosexuality. The child may be seeking escape from a situation in which they feel powerless and unsafe. These behaviors are indicators that a child may be sexually abused. Talking about this with a young boy or girl can be quite difficult. Many children will find it quite difficult to acknowledge the fact that they've been sexually abused. Children who are sexually abused are often very ashamed of what has happened to them. They often feel that it's their fault that they've been victimized. Often what we'll find is perpetrators will manipulate them into believing that they caused the abuse. They will also um, threaten them subtly um, by saying things like, your mother won't love you anymore if you tell. Bad things will happen to you and your family if you tell. Again, what the, what the adult is doing is they're manipulating the child into believing that the abuse was their fault uh, and that they will be held accountable for what has happened to them when in fact the abuse, the abuse is never the child's fault. It's always the fault of the adult involved in the act. The secrecy, shame, and guilt associated with sexual abuse make it difficult for a child to discuss his or her situation. Respect the need for privacy by talking in a location where there are no interruptions. Sit near the child and touch him or her only with permission. Be alert for indirect statements alluding to the abuse. I just don't feel good. You just don't feel good. Is anything uh, happening at home? Is your mom and your dad okay? Yes. They're fine. How about your little brother? He's fine. Most of the time a babysitter's there. The babysitter's there? Who's the babysitter? Mr. Casey. Mr. Casey? I don't know Mr. Casey. Who is Mr. Casey? A friend of the family. He's a friend of the family? Have you known him a long time? Yes. Okay. Does he come often? Yes. He does? So you've seen 
a little upset. Is there something you want to tell me? Because he won't leave me alone. He won't leave you alone? I don't understand. What do you mean he won't leave you alone? He just keeps bothering me. He bothers you? How? He just won't leave me alone. He won't leave you alone? How won't he leave you alone? <laughs> he just keeps touching me and he won't leave me alone. He won't leave you alone. The types of statements you just heard and the behaviors we described are consistent with children who have been sexually abused. They are cause for suspicion. Um, and her sister at 10 puts her to bed. You play a critical role in ensuring the safety of a child whom you suspect may be a victim of abuse or neglect. When your observations and a child's statements have created a basis for suspicion in your mind, it is time for you to act. You have two reporting options. You can report to your local social services department during normal business hours, or you can call the toll-free Child Abuse and Neglect Hotline 24 hours a day. Keep in mind that you do not have to prove abuse or neglect, only suspect it. Reporting is not at your discretion. Remember, it is the law and your duty to immediately report your suspicions. Child Protective Services cannot act until you make a report. Failure to report is a Class 3 misdemeanor. Remember, you are not acting as an investigator. When you report your suspicions to Child Protective Services, you are fulfilling an important responsibility as part of a community of people who want to ensure that all children live healthy and safe lives. Child Protective Services, may I help you? I'm just calling to um, report a situation that is a little concerning to me, and I just want to um, talk to you about it and, and see if there's something we can do for a, a little girl, one of our um, students here. Yes. She's unkempt. Uh, her hair's a mess. Uh, her clothes are dirty. Um, she has hygiene problems, I, I would say. And she's dressed inappropriately for the weather. Right, right, right. She says that she dresses herself in the morning because her mother's asleep. Uh, she also says that she cooks by herself. Sometimes her sister cooks, and her sister's only 10. Um, and her sister at 10 puts her to bed. And um, the mother apparently, again, is either sleeping or according to the, the, um, the little one, her name is Brittany, um, her mother's at work or at the store. So I'm concerned that the two are home alone and that they are not being adequately supervised. And uh, I just wanted to report that. Talk to me in reference to what type, specifically, what type of health problems is, is this child having? Well, uh, this was the second time that she's been sent from her, uh, her classroom uh, because of a complaint that she couldn't see the blackboard. And I remember her from last year, uh, and I remember that she was sent to me last year and she was supposed to go see a doctor. I sent a note home with her mother um, so that she could see a doctor and uh, possibly have an eye exam and maybe get glasses, and I never got a response on that note. And um, then she was back today, and again, the report is that she can't see, you know, the blackboard. Uh, well, ma'am, we, we can take this report, and what we'll do is we'll assign it to one of the investigators here, and you can expect them more likely to come to the school to actually speak to both children. Uh, in reference to what's going on, so you may want to let a teacher know that uh, you can expect someone from Child Protective Services to come out to speak to the children. Then from there, we will proceed to go to the home and make contact with the parents. Now, sometimes parents can uh, react by saying, you know, what gave you the right to go to the school, talk to my children? That's by state policy, we have that right to do. They may stop playing with who told you this. We, by law, do not release that information. They may still Okay. Uh, come to the school, may want to make some inquiry as to oh, yeah. who may have called. The thing that covers all school personnel is that you are mandated reporters. And basically when children are presented with any type of issues, you're just making a report. You're not making conclusions about anything. You're just saying you have concerns. You just feel that needs to be called. There are many things we can do as professionals or simply as adults who care to help the children we know and their families. So often, we don't understand the signs. You know, if you've grown up in a home free from abuse and neglect, you don't recognize the signs of abuse and neglect. And training is very important, you know, whether it's absenteeism, whether it's, whether it's uh, bruises, whether it's uh, other injuries that are unexplained, we need to be able to recognize 
abuse and neglect. By meeting your obligations under the law, you may be the one person in that child's life who makes a difference. You can start by listening to them with your eyes, ears, and your heart.